Men dream of women. Women dream of themselves being dreamt of. Men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. Women constantly meet glances which act like mirrors, reminding them of how they look or how they should look. Behind every glance is a judgment. Sometimes the glance they meet is their own, reflected back from a real mirror. A woman is always accompanied, except when quite alone, perhaps even then, by her own image of herself. While she is walking across a room, or weeping at the death of her father, she cannot avoid envisaging herself walking or weeping. From earliest childhood, she is taught and persuaded to survey herself continually. She has to survey everything she is and everything she does, because how she appears to others, and particularly how she appears to men, is of crucial importance for what is normally thought of as the success of her life. A woman in the culture of privileged Europeans is first and foremost a sight to be looked at. What kind of sight is revealed in the average European oil painting? There were portraits of women as there were portraits of men. But in one category of painting, women were the principal ever-recurring subject. That category was the nude. In the nudes of European painting, we can discover some of the criteria and conventions by which women were judged. We can see how women were seen. What then is a nude? In his book on the nude, Kenneth Clark says that being naked is simply being without clothes. The nude, according to him, is a form of art. I would put it differently. To be naked is to be oneself. To be nude is to be seen naked by others and yet not recognized for oneself. A nude has to be seen as an object in order to be a nude. In the European oil painting, nakedness is not taken for granted as in archaic art. Nakedness is a sight for those who are dressed. That is why Manet's painting, which really marks the end of the period I'm considering, is so profound a comment on all the works which preceded it. The story begins with the story of Adam and Eve as told in Genesis. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And the Lord God called unto the man and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Unto the woman God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Two things are striking about this story. They become aware of being naked because as a result of eating the apple, each sees the other differently. Nakedness is created in the mind of the beholder. The second striking fact is that the woman is blamed and is punished by being made subservient to the man. In relation to the woman, the man becomes the agent of God. In medieval art, the story is often illustrated scene following scene, as in a strip cartoon. During the Renaissance, the narrative sequence disappears, and the single moment, which is nearly always depicted, is the moment of shame. The couple wear fig leaves or make a modest gesture with their hands. But now, their shame is not so much in relation to one another as to the spectator. It is the spectator's looking which shames them. Later, as painting became more secular, many other subjects offered the opportunity of painting nudes. But always in the European tradition, the nude implies an awareness of being seen by the spectator. They are not naked as they are. They are naked as you see them. Often, as with the favorite subject of Susanna and the Elders, this is the actual theme of the picture. We join the Elders to spy on her. She looks back at us, looking at her. Sometimes the woman, Susanna, looks at herself in a mirror, picturing to herself how men see her. She sees herself, first and foremost, as a sight which means a sight for men. Thus, the mirror became a symbol of the vanity of women. Yet the male hypocrisy in this is blatant. You paint a naked woman because you enjoy looking at her. You put a mirror in her hand and you call the painting vanity. Thus morally condemning the woman whose nakedness you have depicted for your own pleasure. And thus, incidentally, repeating the biblical example by blaming the woman. The judgment of Paris was another favorite mythological subject with the same inwritten idea of men looking at naked women and judging them. Paris awards the apple to the woman he finds most beautiful. Beauty in this context is bound to become competitive. The judgment of Paris is transformed into the beauty contest. Aesthetics, when applied to women, are not as disinterested as the word beauty might suggest. I don't want to deny the crucial part that seeing plays in sexuality, but there's a great difference between being seen as oneself naked or seeing another in that way and a body being put on display. To be naked is to be without disguise. To be on display is to have the surface of one's own skin, the hairs of one's own body turned into a disguise, a disguise which cannot be discarded. Amongst the tens of thousands of European oil paintings of nudes, there are perhaps 20 or 30 exceptions, paintings in which the artist has seen the woman revealed as herself. This Rubens. This Rembrandt. This Georges de Latour. These paintings are as personal as love poems, and their character is quite distinctive. Most nudes in oil paintings have been lined up by their painters for the pleasure of the male spectator owner who will assess and judge them as sights. 
Their nudity is another form of dress. They are condemned to never being naked. With their clothes off, they are as formal as with their clothes on. Those who are not judged beautiful are not beautiful. Those who are are given the prize. The prize is to be owned, that is to say, to be available. Charles II commissioned this secret painting from Lely. It's like hundreds of others. It might be Venus and Cupid. But in fact, it was a portrait of one of his mistresses, Nell Gwynne. It shows her passively looking at the spectator, staring at her naked. Her nakedness is not an expression of her own feelings. It is only a sign of her submission to his demand. The painting, when he shows it to others, demonstrates this submission. His guests envy him. By contrast, in another tradition, nakedness is a celebration of active sexual love as between two people. The woman as active as the man. The actions of each absorb the other. In oil painting, the second person, or the second person who matters, is the stranger looking at the picture. Compare the expression of these two women. One the model for what is considered a masterpiece by Ang, and the other an ill-paid model for a photograph in a girly magazine. Or these two. Just the expression, the look. What do you see? It seems to me that in each pair the expression is remarkably similar and that it is an expression of responding with calculated charm to the man whom she knows is looking at her, although she doesn't know him. It is true that sometimes a painting includes a male lover, but the woman's attention is very rarely directed towards him. She looks away from him, or she looks out of the picture towards he who considers himself her true lover, the spectator owner. This painting was sent as a present from the Grand Duke of Florence to the King of France. The boy kneeling on the cushion and kissing the woman is Cupid. She is Venus. But the way her body is arranged has nothing to do with that kissing. Her body is arranged in the way it is to display it to the man looking at the picture. The picture is made to appeal to his sexuality. It has nothing to do with her sexuality. The convention of not painting the hair on a woman's body helps towards the same end. Hair is associated with sexual power, with passion. The woman's sexual passion needs to be minimized so that the spectator may feel that he has the monopoly of such passion. There were paintings which depicted male lovers. These did exist, but they were mostly private, semi-pornographic pictures. In most paintings which were painted to be seen rather than hidden, the only rival to the male spectator is a Cupid. And how extraordinary it is that the pictorial symbol of passion was a small boy. For a similar reason, women in the European art of the oil painting are seldom shown dancing. They have to be shown languid, exhibiting a minimum of energy. They are there to feed an appetite, not to have any of their own. The appetite was theoretically Gargantuan. The absurdity of this male flattery, although it was not seen as absurd then, reached its peak in the public academic art of the 19th century. Prime ministers discussed under paintings like this. When one of them felt he had been outwitted, he looked up for consolation. The nude in European oil painting is usually presented as an ideal subject. It is said to be an expression of the European humanist spirit. I don't want to reject entirely the truth of this, but I've tried to add to it, starting off from a different viewpoint. Dürer, who believed in the ideal nude, thought that this ideal could be constructed by taking the shoulders of one body, the hands of another, the breasts of another, and so on. Was this humanist idealism? Or was it the result of an indifference to who any one person really was? Do these paintings celebrate, as we're normally taught, the women within them, or the male voyeur? Is there sexuality within the frame, or in front of it? 
I showed the programme, as you have seen it up till now, to five women. It began to seem absurd that the only images you were seeing were of women silent, mute. So I showed it to them and asked them to comment, to comment not so much on the programme but rather on the questions raised by it. Above all on the question of how men see women or have seen them in the past and how this influences the way women see themselves today. Of course we all have an image of ourselves and it's a visual image. Uh, but I wonder how much this sort of classical European painting has shaped that image. In my own case, I find it quite impossible when I look at the paintings that you show in your film. I can't take them seriously. I cannot identify with them because they are so immensely exaggerated always. You know, they fasten on to some secondary sexual characteristic, you know, these enormous breasts and sort of great big uh, bee sting bottoms, you know, and those huge <laughs> things like that. And they just aren't real. Whereas with photographs, um, you, you, can, you can feel that is potentially, that's possibly me, although no, but, uh, it, it probably isn't. But these, these, nearly all the paintings you have shown, um, are what is called idealized. Um, and therefore, they are, to me, very unreal in connection with, with any deep down image that I might have of myself and in connection with any deep down pleasure that I might have in mm. looking at another female body. They don't give me that kind of pleasure at all. I can admire them as painting, but they, are, they, they don't mean human beings to me. Um, the image that I compare myself with is the photograph, because it's with photographs that I've been encouraged to think of myself in this way. It is essentially advertising for me that's contributed to this. And consequently, I find it extremely interesting to go back and think of nudes in this way, because I've never done so. But having seen the film, I have no doubt that the same thing applies. And do you find the, the nudes in painting unreal in the same way? Yes. Well, you can't get any information from it, <laughs> can you? It's no guide towards the future. I mean, what kind of might... information is lacking? Oh, well, activity. You know, dynamism, anything. <laughs> it is how someone sees you and that's all. It's something laid upon you. I'm glad you showed the many picture because I always find this extremely shocking you know, because the men are dressed and, and the women are naked and this seems to me sum up the whole situation. It's a humiliating position and these women are aware of being humiliated. Um, and I think this is part of the whole scheme of things. I mean, as most people have had at some stage in their life, sort of nightmares about running through the streets with nothing on and everybody else is dressed. Uh, and this seems to me one element in the pictures. Um, a very interesting thing you said in the film was about um, how nudity was really a kind of disguise. It wasn't the real person themselves and free, but it was just another garment they were wearing, and worse than a garment in a sense, because it's something that you can't take off. This comes, I think, from nudity being combined with a pose. And that's inevitable if you're going to have a painting of a model. Um, in a way, I think that we're always dressing. We're always dressing up for a part, always uh, putting on a uniform of one kind or another. And I think women do this almost more than men. Men have only begun doing it fairly recently. Women are always dressing to show the kind of character that they want to, to represent, the mother, the working woman, the pretty young chick. Uh, and nudity is a uniform, in a way, for I'm ready now for sexual pleasure. You see, and so it doesn't. You 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 can't com you can't identify being nude with being free. I've only just recently read that book Histoire d'eau, um, which describes um, the way in which a woman is reduced for the sexual pleasure of the man she's in love with to a complete object. And what struck me in all that book as the most impressive image was the fact that she was told that she was never to touch her own breasts, to entirely close her mouth, or to close, or to put her legs together. And so the whole point about her stance all the time was that she was available. And this, the sense of being available, the sense of waiting for other people, is the very antithesis of action. And it, you know, 
uh, just like the whole the, the Brook Street Bureau advertisement, Tony hasn't rung, for, you know, he's three minutes late in ringing. And you feel this whole situation, the number of women you talk to who say, mm -hmm. I stay in so many nights a week waiting for somebody to ring. You know, mm -hmm. that the, the concept of availability implies passivity, because if you're simply waiting for somebody else to act, then you can't act yourself. Yes, it's, it's like um, you will awake when a man taps you, you know, when a man kisses you, you will arise and get off your bed. But um, really it's an excuse to get yourself going. I think women are too shy. Yeah. They're, they're waiting too long. <laughs> yes, yes. Could I say something there about narcissism? I think that both men and women are narcissistic, but in different senses. And I think that one, in, sometimes I, I have the impression that men and women are tremendously narcissistic and cut off from each other by their images of themselves, but that whereas a woman's image of herself is derived directly from other people, the mirror you're talking about, um, a man's image of himself is derived from the world. That is, it's the world that gives him back his image because he acts in it. And you know, women are drawn to him as a source, uh, as a center of activity and as a, a source of worth. I mean, since he is in the world, the fact that he values her is important. Um, and so because they're sort of centers of narcissism are different, um, and the woman's is essentially only related to the other person, she's in a much more passive position than he is in relation to it. Yes. Do you see, do you see narcissism as essentially a, 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 a negative or positive phenomenon? Well... I think that's very difficult to answer, but in the sense that it is related to identity, um, it's a positive phenomenon, and it seems to me that what women envy in men a lot of the time is that they have a sense of their own identity, that there is something in them which is important to them, other than simply what other people think of them. And I think that that thing is the product of their interaction with the world, that is, other things and other people. And it's sort of, it's almost as if through this interaction they actually build up a store of worth, a sense of themselves, um, which, it, which is a constant, I mean it can't be lost, but that because the woman doesn't go out and act, she doesn't create the store, she waits only for the present interaction with a man, mm -hmm. that, and that can go, that can just end at any moment, any moment. Um, there's something here that really I'd like to um, twist around a little bit because narcissism is a very sort of pronounced way of stating a relationship to the world, whether it's a man or a woman, isn't it? But um, this other question which is contained within it that doesn't go as far as it as an idea is this sort of self-delight of a person, whether it's a man or a woman, in life, in what they're doing, in their relationships with men or women. Uh, and it's a thing that matters tremendously. And it's not only a kind of inner thing by which you live, but it's a very outer thing by which you gain relationships with your own context in the world that you can't gain any other way. That it's when you have somehow been made so unconscious of yourself that you easily, naturally, sort of compulsively go out to whatever is going on around you. Now, when you're a child, that tends more than with people to be other things, doesn't it? Mountains, streams, wherever you go. Um, uh, and then only gradually, as you go on, you make this kind of absolutely necessary contact with people. But I do think that the sort of essence of self-delight as a kind of 
possible thing in the modern world and something that fewer women have than men and want and must have is the power, the compulsion, not the power, the compulsion to make contact with the world as you are living in it. And when I say that, I don't just mean the people next door or your friends. I simply mean what is going on. Oh, I'm not so sure about the delight. I, I think it's a very double-edged thing. Um, I know, as I suppose I've always known, but I became aware of it in this film, that I have never consciously looked at myself in the mirror and seen myself as I am. I always see the image that I want. I know, and my children notice it, that if I make up my face, I put on a certain expression. If I, from adolescence on, if I've seen myself naked in the mirror, I have not thought of myself as naked, I have thought of myself as a nude. And I think this comes very largely from having been trailed around all the major art galleries in adolescence. You know, this is culture, this is beauty, with a capital B. And, of course, up to a point from advertising too, but much more um, the painting thing. Um, that you, you, you think the female body is beautiful, I am a beautiful object, if not, I have to do something about it. Um, and therefore, the painful part of the narcissistic thing is, I think, the feeling of inadequacy. Um, now, this business of always posing in a mirror, I think one does absolutely automatically, and the result is that if you actually catch yourself in a mirror, um, by chance, that's not deliberately because you're getting dressed or something, you've had a bath, but because there's one in the street or you catch yourself in a, in a shop window. It's a tremendous shock because you suddenly see yourself as you are, which is windblown, untidy, badly dressed, tired, and so on. You don't see the pose at all. And I think this is what happens to women, that they're always trying to measure up to this erotic image that is projected. The, the, there are some paintings and I think in, at this moment in particular of one painting, where there's a woman who is wearing a garment, she's not nude, but it is a garment so loose, so comfortable, so easy, and it's my idea very much um, of, of what a picture of a woman might be like. It, I think it's actually before your period almost, it's so long ago, I mean, it's, it's by Lorenzetti. It comes in the good and bad government, it's a fresco, it's very, very old, you know, and it is a picture of a woman who is supposed to represent peace. It's quite extraordinary, but she could be one of the liberated, or trying to be liberated, young women today. She is at ease, she is relaxed, she is not playing any part at all. She is able to combine pleasure with thought and with dreaming, and she's she might spring into action at any moment. And I th for me, she, she has much, much more to do with, with, with nakedness, with oneself, with the truth about oneself than any number of nudes that I've ever seen. Next Saturday at 2.15 here on BBC Two, John Berger concentrates on oil paintings that celebrate material possessions.